What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we're back with episode number 20 of No Labels Necessary Podcast. Now, why No Labels Necessary? Because artist, content creator, entrepreneur. Today, everybody's a multi-hyphenate, so just get rid of the labels. They're not necessary, and you can catch us on mm, every Tuesday, Thursday, Apple Music, Spotify, here on YouTube, talking about just that, the intersection of music, culture, and money from the perspective of artists and content creators. So before we get in our first topic today, got to touch on something that, hey, we would much so appreciate from you guys. Mm-hmm. We we really appreciate the support so far, but we got a big goal to share. One day we want to get to a million subscribers on this platform and we're going to do everything we can to continue to improve the content. But our next goal is just 150,000 subscribers. That's 25K away. So we know many of y'all appreciate that, but what we can ask of y'all is, don't let it be an underground podcast. Share it with your friends. Share it with your peoples. Because the more subscribers, the more views we get, the better guests that we're going to be able to get as we continue to grow and start to bring in guests, the conversations, the investments, and even the deep dives into information that we can't afford to put out there in the way we want to put out there for y'all yet. It's all going to come. So help us get to 150K. We're starting. We're, we're what? 124 now? Yeah, like so 124, like, 124, 125. So yeah, we're, we're so close, but we're so far away. That's our goal. Now, with that being said, right? Hit that subscribe button. You know, I mean, if you're not subscribing, somehow you got here. But the first topic is a beautiful topic today. Beautiful. beautiful. By none other then our guy, Piff Marty. Now, how many times did you post a piece of content and promote your song in that content? How many times? All right, because I know sometimes y'all say, yo, I'm, I, I don't know how many times I should post. I've been posting too much. Well, we have a great firsthand experience to share with y'all from Piff Marty, and we have some other case studies for y'all. Mm-hmm. Check this out. Repost your videos. I cannot stress that enough. It will literally change your life. A lot of y'all know me for this video. Look, it's okay to be vulnerable because you owe it to you. That went viral in 2021, but I posted that video three times before that happened. First time I posted on Instagram, it capped at like 15,000 views, but I'm like, nah, that's not enough. This is mad important. Let me put it on TikTok. Put it on TikTok, it got like 90,000 views. I'm like, I right, bet. Cool. Now people are recognizing it. But something told me, nah, post it again. 4.5 million views on TikTok, 6 million views on Instagram completely changed my life. If you believe that you sitting on gold, keep promoting it, keep posting it. Sometimes it's the algorithm. Sometimes it's just the, the way culture is set up at the time that you post it. There's so many factors that go into why a video doesn't do well. But if you know that that video is fire, post it again. If I didn't post that video again, I would not be here. Great mm. advice, great advice. Great advice, great advice. Now, before we even get into like deep diving or adding any additional perspective, let's just go to our examples. All right. Now, our client, Simone Talese. All right. You remember, there's a beautiful example of this and we covered it on the agency page. Right. Now, let's just read it headline to headline. This artist changed one thing and blew up her TikTok. Right. This past month, Simone Talese started promoting her song Intentions by dropping TikToks based around her music video. After gathering thousands of views, she decided to change one detail that became vital to her blowing up on TikTok. Can you guess what it could be? Now, if you look at this post, right, this is her video. POV, you just found your favorite underground R&B artist. And that got about a thousand views. She changed that headline. And she changed it to, did she just create the crazy bitch anthem of the summer? Did she? And did 672,000 views. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. Now, because we were there for this, I'm going to say, look, we see this 672,000 views, but she actually did more variations than just these two. Yeah, bro. Right? Yeah, she posted like at least somewhere between like 40 and 50 times. Before ridiculous, it was, it was maybe ten times before that one clicked, and then she posted like twenty more times after, and then she probably posted like twenty more times before. So and now, then it went and, viral in some other ways. Yeah, like she had a couple minutely viral moments. This was the biggest one, but yeah. I mean, she had other ones that maybe hit like twenty, thirty k. You know, what I'm saying fifty k. You know, like an eight k, five k here or there. And I actually think she's still using that clip. Like I think every now and again she'll like throw it mm-hmm. back out there with a with a different headline on it, just to kind of fish yes. up. You know, see what happens. That's the beautiful thing about this, man. Yeah. Like. 
I think people get so caught up thinking like, yo, should I post this again? Are people going to get tired of of seeing this song or whatever it is? But if you've only gotten a thousand views, you know, people ain't really seen it like that yet. Right. And like Piff said, if you believe in this, then keep pushing, keep pushing 10 times before she got to this headline. She continued to experiment with the headline and she also used this one. When she found out this worked, she Mm -hmm. posted this exact clip. A couple more times. Yeah. I remember seeing that. But she also said, yo, shoot, if a one headline change can make that big of a difference, then maybe I should go crazy and figure out another headline yeah. and see if we can get something bigger. But literally, we're talking about 1,000 to 672,000 views. Now, another honorable mention, Gibson. Now, you don't know Gibson. Gibson hit me up in um, like the DMs. But he saw that post, right? And when he saw that post, he went and did the exact same thing. Okay. Right? He just went and changed his headline. Now, I'm going to read off the growth that he saw between different headlines and formats. This video that I'm playing right now did 394 views. You see it has 33 likes. Now, he switched it up and did 28K views. He switched it up again and did 9K views. Switched it up again and did 63,000 views. Okay. Then he did 70,000 views and then he did 63,000 views again. But again, this might not be hundreds of thousands. However, when you talk about he only got 394 on that first one. Yeah. Right. And now he's gotten tens of thousands of views just changing the format a little bit because he didn't really change. Well, no, he did add a headline. Let's go to the current version, the current highest version. No, that actually isn't the highest version, I don't think. No, it, it, it might be, but this one did very well. Obviously, you throw the Gunner situation in there, <laughs> yeah. the Young Thug. Which, Charleston White. Charleston White. <laughs> this is this is actually really beautiful because it ties in to what? What Piff Marty said. Culture. Culture. Yep. Exactly. Things change up a little bit. Now a moment happens where your song is relevant. The name of this song is like snitching or no snitching, by the way. And like he okay. marketed it as like a snitching anthem or something, whatever. So now you have a moment in culture where, oh, did Gunna snitch on Thug? Charleston White, like you, like you said, obviously he had all these snitch videos. That makes a big difference. So maybe culture isn't ready for your song. Hopefully yeah. culture didn't pass. But even if something passed, there's probably another another moment that'll come, let alone the algorithm and other different nuances. So, man, how many times should you repost? Should you repost if your song is that song? You really feel like this is one and it didn't really do what you thought. It might not be over. Like, yeah. for real. Yeah. Post again. Yeah. And the, the culture one is interesting, too, because that's such a hard thing to quantify. And yes. it's such a hard thing to get clients to understand. Because yeah. I don't know if you remember, we had this one campaign like two years ago. Um, and it was a not exactly this, but it was an influencer campaign. You know, influencer campaigns were testing out different headlines, reusing the same clip. Mm-hmm. And I remember we had the, the, the guy. He had a line. The song was like something about like I eat with rats before I hang with more snakes or some shit. Yeah. And when the line came out, it was when the world was crucifying six nine for the whole snitch thing. Yes, right, right? bro. Exactly. I know exactly yeah. who you're talking about. And yeah. I remember that moment. Yeah. yeah. And that shit went viral because everybody assumed he was talking about six nine, and, and he then wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't <laughs> right. And then the artist text who on the move on it. Maybe like two weeks later, he's like, I got the budget to keep it going, and we use that, that same headline. But in that two weeks. Six nine kind of started going his apology tour, right? He started doing yep. some antics to win people back over, and the cultural landscape has shifted now. Whereas, like the last post, there were thousands of people like agreeing with him and fucking with him for, you know, what I'm saying, dissing six nine. Yeah, the ties completely changed, and everyone in the comments like, "Oh, this nigga just hating," you know, what I'm saying, blah blah. He wish he could be <laughs> six nine. And it was like it was so interesting to see. It was like, man, yeah, bro, just crazy. in just in the two week time span, everyone's opinion on the whole situation just flipped, yep. and it's having this negative impact on the, the campaign and I've even talked to artists in like our, our boot camp before where you know some will come in and say things like hey you know you guys use this I don't know cover challenge as an example but it's not working for me mm. and then I was like well yeah when we made that you know TikTok love covers and then you came in at a time where they're sick of it not saying like necessarily now they're sick of it yeah. but like cultural interests change right and like it's very yes. possible that you see something you hop on it 
And by the time you put it out, we're tired of it as consumer base, and then vice versa. You see something, put it out, and it hits right as we're starting to care about it, right? And then you kind of like latch on to the moment. So I right. like that he mentioned culture because that's I all. Love that, that, that's bro. always the hardest one to quantify. It is that perfect example. Also, on what you said was 2020, everybody was dancing on TikTok. Yep. Boop. 2021 and beyond. Yeah, eh, we tired of that. Yeah, exactly. But no more dances unless that no shit really gonna hit or the song really gonna hit. Right. Yeah, Thanks. and and also the the thing I always always argue with artists about with the reposting thing is one you spend all this time and effort into it to post it once and to get like a hundred views right Mm -hmm. a couple hundred views when in reality you have nothing to lose by trying to get it to do better there there are some platforms right like an instagram or youtube where that that worry of reposting something i think is legit because the platform typically is like a one take platform right but if you're creative enough you can you can rework it in different ways to get it back out there but something like tiktok specifically bro nobody cares because most of your people are probably coming from the for you page Mm -hmm. so these are people that are just seeing you for the very first time they don't even know that you posted this clip 20 times over until they go to your page and you wanted that point because you interested them enough to, to get them to even care to go check that out right so it's like you really had nothing to lose. You put six hours into a piece of content to post it once and get 100 views. You know what I'm saying? Like crazy, bro. When it's like, hey, like Simone, hey, man, I spent all this time, energy on this music video. I don't know how much money she spent, but, you know, let's, let's say let's say $3,000, right? Yeah. And so it's like, man, I could have posted three clips from this music video. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, that been the worth there. But I posted this shit hella times and got a bigger return on my investment than I would have initially gotten with my original strategy, right? And that to me makes so much sense for artists a majority of artists that aren't like popping right it's like right. maybe a big artist couldn't get away with this but everyone below like a six could 100 percent get away so with this. perfect glad you said this mm-hmm. and i mean this whole topic goes right into a discussion that oh, yeah. was on brand man network right now for those of y'all who don't know what brand man network is it's our free space got courses you you think you like the podcast if you talk about step-by-step information they drive you where you need to go so you can just reference we have free courses but we also have this space where people can talk and we give a lot of advice and you talk with our team personally so the question was am i draining my audience right am i draining my audience as an artist and eddie harp shout out to you said, I know for me personally, I've always been worried that I was draining my audience by putting out content that feels rehashed or not original or varied enough. Remember that it takes more than six to eight exposures to your song or content before someone takes the chance to listen. With the way algorithms work, especially with short-term content, some people might not get to see it until you post the 10th or 20th variation of promo for the same song. Be patient and remember the long game. You're creating a world and lore for new fans to step into and immerse themselves in. Mm-hmm. Man. Beautiful. beautiful, Eddie. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. He's touched on so many things here. And I want to just break down the different elements of it. Right. So let's start here. At this point, he says, he says, remember that it takes more than six to eight exposure to your song or content before someone takes a chance to listen. Yep. All right. And remember when I first saw this post, I was like, yeah, it's crazy because that goes along that same statistic that you get for sales calls, mm-hmm. making a sales call six to eight points of contact before you actually have true contact when they'll answer the phone Mm -hmm. or they give you reply on email. So they might see you in an ad. They might see that you tweet them. They might see your first email. They might see your second email like in their inbox, Mm -hmm. right? But they might not click it. So they've been exposed, but they haven't clicked it to truly consume. Or you have people literally just missing every single one, right? So there's a reason that you want to hit people up multiple times. And this is no different than hitting people up, right? You're online. Yo, I'm posting this. I'm posting this. I'm posting this. I'm posting this. And how many times have you seen a video online and you didn't watch it that time? Yeah, You might have saved it and said, I'm going to watch it later. Or sometimes I'll just be like, I'm going to look it up. So I remember the title. There's so many versions of I'm not watching it now. I do want to watch it later. Yeah, But if it doesn't pop up again, it gets distant. And more and more distant because I get berated with new content. Yeah. But if I see that thing again, oh, yeah, I did want to watch that video. And a lot of times, let's just say YouTube, it's YouTube's algorithm saying, hey, bro, like, 
you still acting like you want to watch this video yeah. based on the stuff that you're yeah. watching. Come on, watch this thing. But you can create that same effect yourself by posting, posting, posting. So that stat alone is something that artists really need to dig into and just follow you, like just black out like six to eight. That's how much it's going to take. And you might not do it with everything, yeah. but like we just saw with Piff and Simone, when we were talking about early in the episode, if it's something that you know, like this is that thing, this should move, give it another try. Yeah, especially the response to the uh, the lower performing pieces overall positive, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. You Great know, point. Because it's, it's so many factors that can go into it. Like we already touched on cultural. Sometimes you just post at the wrong time of the day, right? Like you pick mm -hmm. the wrong part of it. Like, it's so many things that go into it that I always feel like, like you were saying, if you truly feel like the song is the one, yep. then you have to give it at least like, I don't know if I could put a number on it, but I would say at least like 30 to 50 pieces of content before you truly say like, okay, I, pu I put this up 50 times and people still are not fucking with it. Okay, it's the music. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> most of the time, in those scenarios, it's the content, right? And like, yeah. so there'll be artists who will give up at content number three, content piece number three, thinking the song is terrible. And it's like, no, your your content skills were maybe trash and then get it yep. the, the, the uh, eyes it deserved. Um, or like, you know, the headline was off, so it didn't keep people's attention long enough. Like, there's so many little pieces that could be the reason of why it didn't take off that, mm -hmm. like, you really do need that many at bats before you can truly say, nah, it was the music. You know what I'm saying? That, that's kind of holding people back. And I, I like acquainted to the sales call because I don't think a, enough artists think of fan conversion like sales, right? And it, really, it truly is a numbers game, right? Yeah. It's like you put up a thousand shots, bro, some of them are going to hit, you know, hit, As, bro. assuming certain quality things and, 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 you know, entertainment value and things like that. But it really is a numbers game, man. It's like how many times can you keep micro inching towards getting this person to fuck with you, right? And there are plenty yeah. of artists that I've come across where it, it took a lot of pieces of content before I finally broke and converted, right? Uh, hey, yeah. but you broke. Yeah, and I broke. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and it's like, man, like, okay, like like you said, imagine if it took me post number nine to give them a chance, but they stopped at post number three. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I wouldn't even be here. And who knows how many other people wouldn't even have been there in the pipeline. So, like, I don't know, man. I, I It's one of those things that I feel like we have personally been fighting hard for for a very long time. Right. And I'm glad to see the narrative is starting to kind of trickle out there. And, and, you know, I don't I still don't think there are enough examples. There's not enough. Yeah. But I mean, we have these clear anecdotes. Hopefully this clip, the two clips that we'll probably chop up from this yeah. really help people understand. Like visually, you can see the difference just from posting more than one time. Yeah. Because Piff also talked about the algorithm. You know, yeah. Eddie yeah. mentioned the algorithm. So what does the algorithm mean? You talked about the For You page, right? Yeah. So on TikTok, especially of all platforms, this is extremely meaningful. On TikTok, you can have a thousand people in a bucket, right? But your content starts in miniature buckets and grows out, yeah. right? And shows to more and more people. So let's just say there's a thousand people on the platform of TikTok in your niche. TikTok might show it to 500 people, right? And then it might show another post to 200 people that have zero overlap with those first 500 people. Yeah. Or half of those people might be overlap, right? You got like 100 that have already watched and then 100 that didn't watch. So every time you post, it's not even the same people that are seeing it yeah. on a platform like TikTok. People are completely unaware, let alone, like you said, them um, however many times that you might have posted. So the algorithm works that way. But then... That's actually a negative thing when you think about it, because it's like, dang, well, if people, if I'm only getting a whole bunch of one offs, I'm missing out on that consistent content contact that six to eight times people have to see me. So now you really can go hard. Yeah. Like yeah. Simone Talese, where she posted like 40 times because mm -hmm. some of these people have never seen this before. And then by the 10th time, I had some people who've seen this once, some people who have seen it three times, some people who have seen it 10 times. Right. Yeah. You're constantly getting this overlap, but it's never 100 percent. So the way the algorithm works is nowhere near the OG Instagram chronological order way of things where mo time, nine times out of 10. Only people who follow you are going to see it, but they're going to see it on their feed. So they'll damn near see probably 80% of the, your post. Mm -hmm. That day is far gone. It's not even Instagram anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So look, the algorithms, the way they are set up, there are good reasons that you will not, that you can post things more than one time and not have anything to worry about, let alone the fact that most people need to see it uh, more than once. The last thing 
um, for this that I want to touch on, though, that Eddie mentioned was variation. He used the word variation. And this is like one of the first YouTube videos I remember making like years ago. And the whole concept was the way variation prevents the concept of spam. Like people mm, feel like they're yeah. spamming when you're being yeah. lazy. And it's the exact same thing again and again and again and again. But when you create a variation, whether it's a new headline, whether you introduce a slightly different part of the song first, maybe one's vertical, maybe one's horizontal, there's color changes. It's a new video, same song, right? A new meme that you relate to the song. As you change all these different elements and things vary, it creates a new type of entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're entertaining people with the same thing from different directions, how there's like multiple angles to the same joke, yeah. right? That creates that concept and people begin to appreciate it because they see that you're continuing to change things up and it becomes a joke because they see what you're doing, like the graduation. Oh, I saw he did this and he did this and he's doing different things for the same thing. So that oftentimes is appreciated versus, oh, he just told me the same thing the exact same way every single time. I'm going to tune that out because I already consumed that. Yeah. There's nothing else new for me. But if I see that new thing, I'm already familiar with the first thing that occurred. So now I now focus on the new thing that you did. And that's going to allow me to appreciate your creativity. So it's just about entertaining people at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah, that's such a good point, bro. Because it's like, I think we get so wrapped up on the the video content itself and being like oh like this is the content but the overall package is really the content so yes. even even just changing out 100%. the headline technically makes it a new piece of content right yep. like you said there's a new joke i have to process there's a new path you're kind of taking me down it's a good ass point yeah it's a good ass point yeah man so look i mean i think if y'all don't get what we said today <laughs> bro if y'all can't become comfortable with posting the same piece of content multiple times just changing things to help it perform better or even the same piece of content at different times because maybe it just hit wrong that day, that time and culture, whatever was going on. Look, I don't know what to do, how we could convince y'all any more than what's already been said. Yeah, here. bro, it's a time saver, it's a budget saver, and if yes. nothing else, nothing else, look at it like a training exercise. Because most of you, I hate to be you know that guy, but most of you probably suck at making headlines and copy and stuff, and this is the perfect way to, to yes. perfect it, right? Keep trying, keep throwing some at-bats. And also, I think it scratches that itch that artists have of uh, multiple creative ideas where it's like, hey, I have yep. 20 different ideas for this post. Which one should I do? All of them. <laughs> Every <laughs> single one of them. Because yes. I can't tell you if you're going to be right or which one's going to be right or wrong. Sean can't tell you. You can't say, bro. Just post all of it. Right. Nobody knows for 100% sure. Yeah. Right. Now, next thing. Which genres make the least money when they collaborate? All right. If you collaborate with another artist, how which type of artist would you rather uh, collab with, and how much money should artists make from a track when they collaborate? That's a question that we're gonna have a discussion about. I don't want to say answers, yeah. but we got a <laughs> clip to show y'all. All right. Now check this out from none other than Ray Daniels. He makes unless she has everything to do with publishing. How I do it on the urban side was was that the beat was fifty percent, the hook was twenty, each verse was ten, and the bridge was ten. A verse and a hook, I'm taking thirty percent. But when I got to the pop side, it was it was way different. They just split everything even. It's like yo, it's eight writers, break it down. The reason why I like their way better is because now we're not worried about who contributed and did what. Like now, if CJ's in the room, I'm not worried about did CJ program the drums properly because he's in the room. We're gonna split this evenly. So this is his baby as much as it's my baby, rather than the way urban side is we're gonna write the hook i wrote the hook man I, I gave him the first four words on the intro it's like come on bro if we all know it's our song equally we care more so if i wrote the hook and tamira has a better line for it i'm not thinking oh man she just cut into my 20 percent. i'm like hey this is our shit help me out give me something it's more collaborative rather than who did what and claiming and fighting over pennies i just don't believe in that all right now I know some of y'all might have y'all thoughts on this, but I do think he made some valid points. So we're going to discuss yeah. all sides because there were a couple notable names who had their own thoughts on this as well. Corey, what do you think, though? Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting. man. I, I, I do think there are cultural differences between, let's just say, rap and pop when it comes to collaboration. Because pop in itself is a naturally collaborative um, genre because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, 
I hate to be that guy, but you know, most pop artists kind of get brought into situations where there's a <laughs> there's a team of people helping them. They're bred yeah. from day one to be collaborative, yeah. versus rap tends to be this like, hey, I, like I got it out the mud, you know what I'm saying? Type of genre, like look at what I can do and what I can kind of handle. So yeah. I do think that there's a, a natural affinity for pop artists to kind of want to collaborate, and I could see how this process would be beneficial because, like you said, it's like everybody's making the same amount there's an there's equal drive for us to make sure that this thing does well versus you know if i know i'm only getting paid shit 10 percent for the hook i might have a great idea for the verse but i might hold it back because it's like i ain't paid for that you know what i'm saying like i'm gonna let the guy get paid for the verses you know what i'm saying show approve what what he can do so that's the one thing that i love about his suggestion and the equal splits now you have truly everybody there Mm-hmm. trying to create the best song possible. Yep. Because now we're getting an equal percentage, but we only can increase our percentage by making the song do as good as possible. Yeah. All right? And it has to be a better song, theoretically, right, to perform better. Yeah. Otherwise, my other my competition is not only the marketplace, but the other person creating this song with me. So I like that aspect of it, but let's get into some of the thoughts of others. Now, Let's see. Verse Simmons said, agreed. This is great, except for when you wrote most of the song lyrics and melody and you got to split it evenly with the dude in the corner that just said, quote unquote, the. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So there's that facts. Like everybody's kind of on that same that same perspective. And you can kind of get the same from Candy, Candy Burris. Uh, Was it Escape? Yeah. yeah, escape yeah. from escape. I don't agree with this one. Don't come in the room and say one line and be expecting an equal share. Not happening. Now, Candy's a writer, writer. Yeah. Right? She's written like things, I think, all by herself, let alone, of course, you know, some collaborations. And I, so I get this, right? I get this. So it's one of those things where how do you ask the individual to buy into the ideology of the whole, the greater good, quote yeah. unquote, right? It's yeah. like democracy. This is what we deal with in America. What do we always hear people say when in terms to vote? What do they say? Vote for your... Your beliefs? Beliefs, another word they say is interest. Okay, there we go. Vote yeah, for your yeah. interest. Yeah. But oftentimes our interest is not the best interest of the country as a whole from time to time, right? Yeah. Right? Like, Because yeah. there's so many different... <laughs> interest to deal for and account for in a country like America where we're supposed to be accepting all these different people da 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 right so how do you do that you relate that back to an artist ah I hear what you're saying but man I'm putting in this work and man's ain't putting in this work like I'm putting in this work so I can get the personal difficulty with doing something like that but I do appreciate where he's coming from like that and you know the the rooms that he's in himself he probably doesn't have to count for that as much at this level i don't, I don't know i'm just yeah. kind of throwing yeah. that out there I, I would love for a songwriter to come on this come in on this episode and answer this for me but i wonder if they account for impact of the line in the song so like so her cap point was the person that wrote one line but it's like what if that one line is the most memorable part of the whole oh, song oh man what song is this what song is this it's a song they said it three times, and uh, not all go everything, Bruno Mars. There's another song, and they just got, oh, Cisco. I saw the documentary, the own song, right? Yeah. You know, don't like a truck. What, what? That was like, what? Uh, all night long. All right, let me see that thong. But at one point, what they say? Living, it was Living a Vida Loco. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, Cisco knew the guy who wrote that song. It wasn't, was it Ricky Martin? Ricky Martin. It wasn't Ricky Martin. He was just a performer of it, but he knew the guy who wrote it. So he thought he was going to go ahead and get a clearance, but for whatever reason, he forgot to do it before the song actually came out. When the song came out, right? Oh, and it started performing like it was performing. Man, of course they hit him up. But that, that line that got repeated three times throughout the entire song, living a vida loca, Bruh, they they said that that songwriter owned and made more money from the song than everybody else combined. That's crazy. Like the Cisco, the producers, all that. So 
that has to be from impact. Yeah. That's my only argument. Like, yeah. like, how can you justify such a something that's literally, when you look at it objectively, a small part of the song? How yeah. do you quantify that? It must be, oh, the impact. And if you gauge it, I don't know what time. Let me look at when um uh Living a Vida Loca came out. Cause it also might have been a hot song at the time, you know what I mean? It had certain all right, so that was 1999. And then Thong Song came out. Oh three? Double two? Year. I remember I was in elementary. Wait a minute. Oh, right. ho, ho, ho. it came out in 1999. Oh shit. Dang. So yeah, that thing was fresh. <laughs> but he tried them, bro. He really risked it. Yeah, he risked it. He should have got it before uh, clear beforehand. Man. Yeah. So that's that right there uh, again goes to impact. Yeah. Cuz impact in, included I could understand what the ones that are saying no. I could I could get that cuz I I will feel that way if if I my part of the song was the most memorable part of the song and like you just wrote like a cool bridge and it's mm-hmm. like no, nah, bro. Everybody in the club singing my shit. Like right. the, the viral part on TikTok is my part. I could I could understand it then, but I right. do think the overall notion of equality across the room right. does probably make the room work harder. Right. And look, to be fair, I think that objectively speaking and looking at how things played out, that song could have did damn well, probably the same without that line. However, in that time, it was highly arguable yeah. right, to say that this has that level of impact. Yeah. So I yeah. get it. It's arguable. Would you have been saying that shit in the first place if I didn't write that song? There's no way he would have said that if that song didn't come out. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, a bro. black guy was never been saying, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? He like never been saying that song. So yeah. I so impact has to have some, I'm assuming, impact, um, I mean outcome on how they judge it in court and things like that when when it goes that far. But but man, I mean, I think this is just a person by person basis or how people are willing to to go about it. It seems like I know quite a few producers who have a similar relationship mm-hmm. to this because they work together so much. You're like, hey, one of these things gonna hit at some point. You know what I mean? And yeah. we don't know which one's gonna hit. We don't know which one's gonna get recorded to, da da da. But we just keep working. And if you on it, we get they bust down their percentages somewhat similar. Producers, if y'all are in any of those circles that are pretty free and you can kind of trust and move like that, let us know. But but we do know if you have a circle like that that can move like that that you trust man it makes creativity flow so much easier yeah. right not having to deal with the business in that way now you might knock somebody outside of your circle over the head i think yeah. that's the more realistic way to have it i got my circle we bust it down even outside that circle it is what it is just like the mikos right yeah. three ways it don't matter if buddy got left off a of bad and bougie you know what i mean it's like yeah. we bust it down equal we take care of the fam and it is what it is yeah so I get both sides, but yeah, again, my solution is probably your specific circle that you can trust and move with like that. Y'all eat. If you have that type of circle, and you don't have to do that way either, but 100% outside of that circle, it probably only makes sense to get what you can out of the situation. You don't even know the people, and it is all business. Yeah, yeah. That's why, too, I really hope some songwriters come in, because I, yes. I also would assume, like you said, it makes the process easier, because Every artist I've ever talked to says the most awkward part of a studio session is when everybody has to sit down and talk about the splits. <laughs> <laughs> like almost every artist I talk to is like, that's when it gets uncomfortable because like, I guess reality sets in that this is business. You know what I'm saying? Like you just yeah. have fun making music. You know what I'm saying? Then it's like, all right, before you leave this room, let's get this legal shit in order. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody leave this room before we get this down on paper. So I, I would assume that if I walked in a room where I know like, okay, all of us in here are getting the same percentage of this. Yeah, that takes some weight off my shoulder. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. like you said, it makes me a little bit more artistically free or a little bit more creatively free. So that that's why like I could I, I get that. Like I, I agree with that. Like I on paper at least to a non songwriter, you know, I'm gonna throw that out there, guys. Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to me, bro. Like bust it down evenly, bro, and let the let the audience decide who should, I guess, quote unquote, be paid more off of it. Right, right. <laughs> now I know a lot of people handle that awkward conversation by just letting the managers yeah, get to it, right? Yeah. That's a great buffer. So that's always nice. So you and the artist can maintain your relationship, let managers do whatever they got to do. Oh, man, he be tripping. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how I go, man. <laughs> got to posture and say what you got to say to get through it. So, but yeah, that that's definitely going to be an ongoing conversation. I'm sure there's not going to be one answer. 
um, for the whole thing. But since I did mention Cisco as a part of this, if y'all have not seen, it's either a voice or no noisy documentary on Cisco Thong Song. It's a brilliant documentary. And the amount of creativity that he put towards that process is really dope. Like it was dope because they had they, the producers made this beat. They did it for Michael Jackson. They even went Cisco. Like they played it for him by mistake, and they were like, "Oh, dope. I can't even imagine Michael Jackson." On that beat. <laughs> <laughs> what? But it wasn't. They didn't. You know, the dong song part didn't exist. Yeah, right? okay, you know yeah, what I mean? okay. That yeah. part didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wild, All right? But. So he ends up like writing this song, the story of how he even comes up with Thong Song. He like went on a date and he saw a thong for the first time. Like this hmm. is when it was in time. The nineties was wild, bro. bro. That's crazy. It was, it's wild because the funny part is, and he told his friends about it, and they were like, "Wait, what?" And then they start like some niggas going out into the city trying to find girls and get you know smash and then hopefully see a thong come across this yeah. with them. <laughs> this mythical thong he spoke, spoke of and then a friend came back one of them was like yo bro guess what what I found found and he was like what that thong the thong 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 and that's where that part came from <laughs> like, like they, and they threw it in for a joke and whatever but he didn't think it was gonna stay so it was like the way it came about and then you see Cisco creatively say, hey, this isn't enough. He went and found a violinist. And you listen back to that song, like that's a huge part of the song. Yeah. Like he went and found that. It was and, and the dude who played the violin, like he was so far from that type of music. Like a classical music. Yeah, dude, like yeah. A, a legit older white man well my, I don't know, he might have been younger then but nah our age he was still older than me right yeah he um and knew nothing really of those that genre and Cisco kind of like had him play it and was like yeah that's exactly how I want it and when it came out and it was a hit he was so detached and he when his friends and people started start talking about it, he was like I wonder if that's that song I played that riff for. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's how detached he was but Cisco was like just grabbing people and even against the producers um, you know, Will and ironically, Michael Jackson loved the thong song so much. He up the producers and I'm like, yo, well, let's get in the yeah, studio. I heard that story before, yeah. bro. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember hearing that. I was like, man, who like who would have thought, bro, thong song be what hey, tickle Michael Jackson's bro. fancy. Hey, bro, Michael. <laughs> no, man. I mean, I'm not gonna get the tickles, but Michael. <laughs> look, <laughs> my Michael was definitely an interesting dude. The more and more I've heard about him. Now, next topic. MTV has been lying to people, folks. MTV has been lying to people, but it's a great example of what you as artists and content creators can do for yourself to go viral, build strong fans. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm about to go ahead and put it on the screen. So let me go ahead and pull up this clip right this she has done here. All right. You can speed that up, EJ, like a little bit of that sound and all that. You can just get straight to this part, you know, get rid of the dead space. We want to do your MTV Cribs. And I was like, oh, and the first thing they I, they said was, all right, we got a couple of houses picked out for you. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, you know what? I got a house for y'all to come to. <laughs> And yo, straight up, yo, like no, no BS, yo. They came to my crib and they walked in my door because I caught them off guard. They have no, uh, they have no clue on how I was living. So they walked up in my shit and they they started looking around like, yo, you live up in here? I was like, yeah, I live up in here. My cousin was sleeping on the floor. And after I showed them the crib, they went outside and had a meeting. Oh, wow. So, so and it was like a film crew of almost this size, and they dumbed it down to like two people. Right. One camera guy and one sound guy, and that was it. They was because wow. that was all that can fit in my house. And they shot it, and at the end they edited and whatever, and then we made magic. And it was like, yo. Hey man, first and foremost, do you remember that episode? I do remember that episode, bro. bro. Classic, unforgettable episode of MTV Cribs. If somehow y'all missed that, you can just Google MTV Cribs or we'll put it a link or whatever. And it, it's a great episode because his house was trash. But <laughs> they've been lying to people. Like when he said they had a house set up for me, mm -hmm. I was like, wait, huh? Like that just hit me. I was like, wait, so they were going to give you a house? What do you mean they had a house for you and then you took them to your real house instead? That sounded crazy. So I looked into it. And you remember JoJo, the singer, right? Yeah. She said her episode 
was fake, right? So she said her and her mom weren't even living in the house at the moment. Her and her mom, for whatever reason, were living in hotels at the moment. So she went to her uncle's house. And her whole episode is just her uncle's house, like her cousins, toys, and all that stuff in that episode. And she, funny enough, said she regretted. She should have just bought out, out and did one of the houses that they do for people. Yeah, 100%, bro. What? <laughs> and, and, and played it big. But that just let me know. I was like, hold up. So not all episodes, apparently, but many of the episodes, hey, completely fake. It's not even these people's houses. Now, doing what we do today, I get it production schedules yeah. you know hey we got to get this thing shot we got to get it in there's so many reasons and it, and it feels different when it's mtv that's tricking you versus the artists like inspiring and conspiring to trick you you know what i mean yeah yeah because they always have that to lean on like it wasn't right. me guys you that, know what I'm saying? It that's was just them. what they want to do but it's weird it does have a weird thing about it but what i want to say to that though for my artist standpoint content creator standpoint this is entertainment, baby. Oh, fake it till you make it. Yeah, fake. I'm like, <laughs> not even a fake it till you make it, bro. Because <laughs> that fake it till you make it gets used so poorly in action. You're like, oh, dang, bro. I ain't mean it like that. I'm talking, <laughs> like, I knew a dude that was in debt because he bought this uh, BMW and all these nice clothes. And he was telling me, like, he bought all this stuff so he could seem like he was doing big. I think, funny enough, he was trying to be an artist, but I was so far from out ever being in the music industry at that point and like i was probably like a freshman in college and he was like he had to maintain that lifestyle because his brother looked up to him and all this stuff but he was broke right faking until you make it so i don't mean that <laughs> <laughs> what i do mean is the ability to create something that's not real and then make it pop though if we go back to em tripling yeah right at the show, creating a fake moment, right? Or creating or reframing a moment in that first case, right? Oh, it was only 13 people out in this show, but I'm so thankful for it. And then that goes viral. Some people making fun of him having 13 people to show. Some people like kind of like cheering him along and encouraging him and calling him humble, all that great stuff, right? Yeah. But he, because he reframed the moment. Then the other moment that we talked about with him is um, particular since we're talking about him is he scripted the whole idea of the yo bro forgot his name had somebody in the camp in the crowd they scripted that right yeah and then obviously that went viral as well so just another example of how so much of this shit around us right in the entertainment industry in particular is fake yeah, bro. Sometimes you just got just got lie until you fly, bro. You know, what I'm I stand I stand <laughs> on that, man. But I, I get it though. It, it kind of makes me think of that uh, conversation we had about artists making other artists pay for their music videos because they have a brand to maintain. Mm -hmm. So I can understand MTV, like you said, one logistics reasons. This makes it faster. We know exactly where we got to go, what mm -hmm. the neighborhood look like, if it's safe. But then also it's like, man, you know, MTV is in the game. They saw behind the scenes. They knew every artist wasn't as popping as they probably portray themselves to be. Yes. It's like, man, do I risk pulling up to an artist's house and getting the red man situation when this show is supposed to be like showing the lifestyle of the grandiose, right? Like, like I kind of paint that, that larger than life image, mm -hmm. especially in the 2000s, bro. The 2000s are crazy, but we assume yeah. every rapper back then was making like a hundred million dollars right. a year or some crazy shit, the right? So was, The lie was in full effect back full then. Full effect, bro. Yeah, every, I believed I, every bit of it. Every entity making sure the lie stands still. You know what I'm saying? So, and then the JoJo one is crazy too, cause I, I can see them in the same situation. Like, oh, you homeless? Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> nah, we gotta get you a not grill. This show. Yeah, the fan, exactly. Now, not today. You ain't. You know what I'm saying? So I, I get it from yeah. that standpoint. But I like that. Uh, you know, more artists are open about that because I think there's a great with smaller artists. I actually seen in a, in a comment on one of our videos where. Someone was saying that their biggest gripe with bigger artists is that they they lot of smaller artists and make them think, you know, the game is a certain way. Yes. Just to, for them to, you know, the lucky few to grind their way up and see like, oh, this shit ain't nothing like, you know, these artists are kind of telling me. And then the ones that never get that far just believe it. You know what I'm saying? And that becomes yeah. like the 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 floor for them. And then they just speak in a way they don't know. So one I just always hated that part. Yeah, bro. Always, bro. It's like, context, right? It's like I feel like my shit ain't popping and working because it's me. Yeah. And yeah. you don't realize, no, it's not you. It's they have things on their side that you are 
unaware of completely. So now you get more depressed and yeah. depressed judging yourself when really your shit ain't popping because you don't have this resource, that resource, or this person, or the timing. Because yeah. sometimes these people just pop and they have no idea why. Yeah. Right? But they'll make it seem like I planned this thing out. Right? So there's, yeah, there's so many ways that it is a detriment to other artists that that follow. Yeah, bro. Even worse that they, they didn't plan it out. But my, my biggest gripe with old artist interviews would be like, you know, how did you make it to this point? Oh, you know, man, I was just kind of doing me. And then like one day it's like, oh my God, bro, he's lying. He's <laughs> lying so hard, bro. Like you said, maybe that's really how they felt because they didn't know what the fuck was going on. You yeah. know, but most of them oh. be lying. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole nother subject. Yeah. We get another day because a lot of there are some who truly feel like I was just doing me, and me is so awesome that the world had to witness this greatness at some point. Yeah. So there, there is some of that yeah, <laughs> as well because they truly are, like you said, just unaware because yeah, the mean, label kind of kept them from that back in the day. Yeah, that's like, bro, you had a two hundred k budget behind you, but because mm. I'm, I'm thinking about it from Red Man's perspective, bro, like that had to be a hard thing to do back then. Because like I said, the two thousands, bro, like we. Every artist was kind of portraying themselves like super grandiose. I guess his um the the benefit to him is that you know he was a I guess the equivalent of like a street rapper mm-hmm. then right he's so grimy, it was, yeah yeah so it was like positive brand building for him yep you know what I'm saying like oh he's still getting it out the mud bro he still got his cousin sleeping on the floor you know what I'm saying <laughs> see what you said right. <laughs> <laughs> that is wow I can't even, I only imagine waking up and then seeing yourself on TV <laughs> like that at some point and. I think just for a small, you know, branding moment, there's layers to this right? because the show branded itself and had to maintain its image. Mm-hmm. Like you said, so, yo, bro, like you want to get this house so we can just make sure everything looks apart and we don't want you looking crazy. Right. But because of that standard, when Matt, the, you know, a red man came like he came, it broke yeah. that norm and then made his episode a viral episode in that time. Like that's one episode that. If you watch episodes, you don't forget that one because it was just yeah. so crazy to see yeah. at that time. Yeah, I remember that, bro. That's what I'm saying. I remember that episode. And I, I don't think a lot of artists would do that today. I think a lot of artists, they would be like, yeah, nah. give, me, give me the house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people to see how I'm really living right now. Give, give me yeah. the house. Yeah, I, I, I actually would agree with that. It, it's still a very rare thing. Um, but yeah, artists, so much of this is a sham. But it's the entertainment industry. So don't think of it as fake like they're trying to trick me as an artist and young professional who's trying to come in a game. It's entertainment. That literally is what it is. Trying it's magic. Yes, yeah, trying to trick the fans. <laughs> it's the movie magic, the TV magic. I remember going to a talk show. It was Monique's talk show when she had it. Here it was at one of Turner's, Turner Studios. And the entire talk show, it was a late night show on BET, was shot in a completely different order than what it showed on TV. Because of the efficiency oh, yeah. of moving yeah. shit around. They had to move the set. We got this one room. So we're going to have Ghostface Killer perform now, even though technically we're not going to have him shown after until after the third commercial break or yeah. something like that. Right. But once we move the set, that chance is going to be gone. So we're not going to move the set back just from the perform. So it makes sense yeah. why all these things are in place in many ways, just like MTV is like, oh, it's easier. We got to schedule. So. There's reasons for it, and then also it's just a better experience. People say they want like realistic movies and things like that, but if you really saw it truly realistic, that should be boring as hell because yeah. they're gonna go through every motion, yeah. in motion. You don't want to see me actually walk all the way down the stairs from my room into this kitchen. Yeah. See me wake up, I might walk in the hallway. Next thing you know, you see I'm on those last two steps walking yeah. into the kitchen. Right? That's what you want to see. You don't want to see every single step. So this is the entertainment industry. That's a part of it. You just need to also make sure that you're not doing something that's going to be a massive threat to your particular brand, right? But aside from the branding image faking it, right? The more important part is just understanding you can create moments in general, right? If you give it the right attention, that can have that can become a bigger moment, yeah, right? right? Like yeah. period, shoot, people do these fake relationships. They make it seem like it's a relationship for a moment. All of this shit, bro, is, is, it's <laughs> entertainment, that's yeah. it. Yeah, bro. You gotta <laughs> uh, gotta deceive until they believe. Hey, uh, hey, man. <laughs> Look, I, I know we 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 coming off the holidays, man. You you, you hung around the old folk over the holidays, <laughs> man. <laughs> lie to you, fly, deceive till they believe, man. You you I look, you look like you need a pin, pinky ring on you right now. Yeah. <laughs> now that last one was just sitting on my heart. Like it, it hit me like halfway through the convo. I was like, I gotta I gotta hold on to this one. Like. <laughs> 
Hey, we we, we gonna put that a, a tweet storm <laughs> of that one. All right, well, let's get into the last topic, which is how much, how much should you allow your fans to be involved in your creative process? All right, I know some people don't want it at all. Some people might lean on their fans or listen to their fans too much. I want to play this quick snippet from Brock Hampton to really get this conversation popping. All right, let me play it right. It's here. interesting that we, as you, it's interesting that we embrace the audience as much as we did and like allow them to be a part of the the painting. Yeah, we give them the paintbrush, and I think that was good and bad. But when it was good, it was great, really, because then you're kind of like all building like this like collective together. All right, so like he acknowledged. Period. There's the good and the bad yep. of having your fans be involved. So I want to touch on some of the good and some of the bad from the perspective we've experienced in things um, as content creators in general, mm -hmm. but then also maybe some of the artist nuances in particular. Now, one, just being a creative is your, yourself. You have a vision on how you want to do things. Mm -hmm. So then you talk about all these pieces of feedback that you're getting. And you're like, no, that's just not the way I want to do it because I'm creative and I have this vision. If I do everything based on what you say, I'm no longer creative. I'm pure marketer or business person just reacting to the best form of feedback. Mm -hmm. I get that, right? So you're trying to sell your vision, not find somebody else's vision and, and follow that. But, you know, again, that other side of the fence, you want to make sure what you're doing connects. And if you're too far off, I mean, what's the point of doing this whole thing if it, if you want to do it as a career, right? If it doesn't at least connect with people to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, right. And like fans too usually try to point you in the right direction, especially mm. when you're growing and, you know, they don't really have a reason to dislike you yet. A lot of times like fans are, you know, they're viewing it from their vanity point. And they maybe even be paying attention to the conversations that other fans are having that you might not be seeing. And so they're like, yo, bro, I'm telling you, man, go go this way. You know what I'm saying? Go this way. Right. And so, you know, I, I think I've seen instances before where, like, the audience is, is steered, the creator or the artist, and in, in completely in the right direction. You know what I'm saying? And I do think I've also seen times where their feedback held the creator back, right? Like, it's almost like too much noise coming. And like mm. you said, the artist starts to lose confidence in their idea. Damn, they don't like my idea. They just want me to do they think it's a good idea and it yep. discourages them a little bit right but you know i you said something like a long time ago that made me think about it differently when you kind of told me about how like tech works right and you told me that you know in tech they believe in just like getting the product out there really fast to get a lot of feedback on it so they can oh, yeah. tweak it yep. that's I man it makes a lot of sense right like i have this thing that, that i think will work right based on whatever my experience is or my viewpoint is and then i get hundreds to thousands of feedback from the people I'm trying to sell it to, right? And like I said, today, people are very vocal, bro. People have no yeah. no uh, problem telling you what they think <laughs> should be better about the thing that you're doing for them. So it's like I have this thousand people in my focus group telling me that, hey, if you did this thing, this shit would be crazy. And, you know, I, I just think it's valuable, right? It's like, like why not get that? Why not get that viewpoint from the people that you are trying to get to purchase the things you're trying to do? So mm. I can understand there being certain elements of a artist career that maybe they don't want to let fans in, right? Like maybe it's like, hey, like I don't think they should necessarily be sitting with you in like the writing room, right? There, but there are also some artists I've seen do like live writing sessions with their fans, right? So, yeah. but I, I can understand an artist going, now, I don't want you here when I'm in the initial creation process. Maybe once I have a, a framework for it, and I don't know where to go or you know, I got three visual concepts for I don't know where to go. Like I, I can understand like giving them a ladder of choice and making them feel like they have complete mm. autonomy over the situation. I think that sometimes is a happy medium. But like they were saying, like, I, I think it's there's enough good that could come out of it that makes me believe that artists should trust their fan base majority of the time. Unless you just have like a trolling ass like fan base. You right, know what I'm saying? Right, like right. a like a DJ academics fan base or something. You know what I'm saying? Where they yeah. just like to fuck with you. And steer you wrong because they think it's funny. You know what I'm saying? But if your <laughs> but if your fan base isn't like that, which is yeah. most artists, then like yeah, you know, let them let them at least give them the illusion of input. You know what I'm saying? Because that can go a long way. No, that because that having at least the illusion of input for a fan allows them to feel like they have ownership 
of some of the process, yeah. right? Yeah. And I've been a part of this. And now that I've been a part of this, I want to support it more as it comes out. Yeah. Because I am not just supporting him. I'm supporting me in a way. Yeah, I'm a part shit. of this vision. Yeah, this is my shit. Yeah. This is my shit. So his world is my world. And now you have people invested in your world and they're going to help you grow it. Yeah. They're going to show up to concerts more or buy things more. Hey, I was a part of um, saying that you should come up with T-shirts or a, set, a certain type of T-shirt instead of doing a dad hat. So now when that T-shirt comes out, I'm like, yo, I want to be a part of it. But, you know, there's also something that, you know, I, I could pull from tech, which is, you know, the core product versus features. And the differentiation is the core product is what people come for, right? It's serving a specific need or behavior that they'll be consistent and use. But then the features is like that shit that it's cool. It's a bell and a whistle, mm. but people don't actually use it, right? It'll be like me saying, man, I would love if Instagram went back to chronological order and the Instagram <laughs> adds it to a different feed, which they have, yeah. and I still never click over there. You know what I mean? It's a feature. It's really cool. And then if you put it on my main feed and made it my only way, I would actually do it. But it's not actually a core product enough where, no, I'm not going to use it unless it has this thing, right? Yeah. Or it's not as functional or useful. So that same applies when you're listening to your fans. You can get a lot of noise. Part of that process is building the skill of understanding one, how do I differentiate between stuff that they're just saying and that's just like them being off the cuff and being careless because yeah. they can say something. Like you said, fans, people love to talk to you these days and give their opinion. Sure. And they feel like it's their responsibility almost for, to make sure the world hears their opinion. Yeah, bro. A lot of fans are stupid. I stand on that. As genius as they might be. Yes. You know, I, yes. I also stand on that. A lot of them are stupid, bro. Oh, there's genius and stupidity, yeah. right? Because sometimes you don't know enough not to say something and that something might be it might it might click at the right time yeah. in the right space. You know yeah. what I mean? But that doesn't mean you're smart just because you got one thing right. You know what I mean? But yeah. but the, <laughs> the, but the but the fair point that I, I I think that again just relates to is you have to figure out how to discern like what I'm going to do. How am I going to take this feedback? Oh, a lot of people are saying the same thing. Maybe it's something I at least need to consider. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest part: being willing to at least like acknowledge and process why they're saying this. Don't just go with the ideas, but why are they saying this? Am I missing something or is there something that they want to gain from it? And if you can pinpoint that, sometimes you can serve that desire without doing the specific thing that they requested because you're like, oh, I got an even better way, right, to get to a certain place. If you go back to Henry Ford saying, if I asked what they wanted, what if I asked the customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? It's a bar. Why do they want a faster horse? Because they want to get there faster. Yeah. So you serve that same need by creating a vehicle that will get them there faster, right? Yeah, and yeah. that's the way you want to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I say this too, man. Like, I truly believe that, like, fans like feeling like they have control over your career. I, fans are wild, bro. Y'all have to y'all have to think about this. If you're an artist <laughs> that, that that has fans, you know where I'm coming from. If you're yeah. artist with no fans, bro, listen up, right? Fans like to feel like. If it wasn't for me, you would not be here today, right? I think we all in our head have this weird fantasy. Like, if I stop listening to this motherfucker tomorrow, he falling off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's why I go back to, like, giving them real choice has a lot of positive benefits. Even if you decide not to listen to them and, and, and um, take into consideration what they're saying. But even just giving them the illusion of choice is very powerful. Because, like you said, they become emotionally connected to it. They start to feel like it's their project. And then you're just feeding into that fantasy of like, hey, I, I need you to survive. Which you do you do need them to survive, but like that individual you may not need to survive the way they feel like you need <laughs> yeah. them to survive, right? But it's like play into the fantasy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, um, um and cause I've seen artists do that where it's like, hey, how many times have we seen artists be like, Hey, I want you to pick my next single? Here go five options. They made more than five songs. You know what I'm saying? Like they have hella songs out. Why right. they only give you that five? Illusion of choice. Right. right. I want, I want, these are five songs I already feel like anyway. Um, I was gonna run with, you know what I'm saying? Me and my team been arguing about it. Shit, if we were all on the same page, you would have never got this choice, but we not. So hey, I'm gonna let y'all decide, right? But as a fan, we just go like, oh, he made these five songs. He can't decide which one. Yeah. That one, that one, that one, right? And it's 
illusion of choice, bro. Illusion of choice. Now, even whenever artists like ask things, I'm like, bro, you don't really mean this, but I'm gonna participate because you at least <laughs> you at least made me feel like you needed me in this situation. Hey, <laughs> much appreciated because fans' desire for that is growing. Yeah, I don't think that existed as much before. Right, people were cool with just witnessing what the artist does. Yeah, right. It was almost this mysticism about it. Right, yeah. which is why you know artists grow up feeling that today, like wanting to operate in a time that doesn't exist. Like, oh, I should be so mystical and I should just create this thing that the world is in awe of. But the world isn't in awe of much these days, to be honest. Yeah. It's a different temperament with the fan bases because people see so much and then people are so, uh, I don't even want to say full of themselves, but it's just, it's just so indifferent because they've seen so many different things. So, what yeah. you really want to experience or I mean, what you're really dealing with is now a fan base that went from, hey, I'm cool with witnessing what this artist does next. I wonder what's going to happen to a general market temperament of. This is a RPG. Yeah. Everything is an RPG. Yeah, I want to be a part of it. You know, I want to be a part of everything. Gaming, likes, comments. Everything is receiving my feedback and functioning as a result of my feedback. That's the perception and that's what people are accustomed to. So if you give me the opportunity to that, it's funny. That's not even as cool anymore. You allowing me to vote on the song, that's novel, great marketing and made me feel amazing back in the day because you gave me the opportunity to vote on the song. Yeah. Today, not so much. Yeah. I might feel more invested and feel like, oh, this person's a good person. But I also feel like I'm kind of supposed to be involved in this process. There's a, there's a sense yeah. of entitlement in today's current fans, too. So, you know, but it does have a benefit. I think like it, it really does have a benefit to allow them to be involved somewhere along the lines. Yeah, because you just, you just made me think about something that we've kind of touched on before in other points. But artists are competing with content creators yes. right and a lot of content creators like just general content creators usually have no issue with letting their their audience drive things right so it's like if i'm a fan and i commented on brand man sean video yo you should make a video about playlists and you make a video about playlists and then i get on this twitch stream like yo you should play the new i don't know pokemon game and then he turns that shit on right and starts playing it mm -hmm. and then you know i go I don't know, comment on like my favorite Instagram comedian. You know, you should make a joke about X, Y, Z. And then five days later, he got a skit about it. At this point, bro, I'm just, I'm just one naturally assuming I'm amazing. Like, bro, you know I'm what I'm saying? Shit, bro. I'm <laughs> exactly. <the shit>. Like, <laughs> yo, I'm killing it, bro. I'm, I'm, I got these motherfuckers up. But then, two, it almost starts to feel like, hey, you person that won't give me that choice, like, how dare you when so many other of my favorite creators at least give me the option, you know what I'm saying, yep. to, to be a part. In some way or another, and like YouTubers are notorious for doing it. YouTubers and streamers, like uh, I feel like, are notorious for giving their audience like so that type of input into what's going on. Like our the whole YouTube landscape is like, hey man, put some shit in the comments so I can read and think about what the next video is about. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's like, and we've been trained to think that way for, I mean, at least what like the last like seven, eight years of YouTube, at yep. least. You know what I'm saying? We already talked about the impact that the YouTube landscape has on just you know uh, content consumers as a whole. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't think about it until you said that, but it's like, yeah, bro, every other creative aspect of my life or, you know, creative person in my ecosystem probably has given me that type of choice at, in one way or another. And you, music <laughs> artist, you person that I see a couple times a month, hey. won't even let me pick something for you, bro? Crazy. I'm not going for that. You know what I'm saying? Bruh. Weird times we live in, man. It's weird times, bro. Weird times. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, with that said, that is yet another episode, episode 20 of No Labels Necessary. Please subscribe if you made it this far and haven't subscribed yet. But more importantly, share this pod, share this pod, No Labels Necessary. We're trying to get to 150,000 subscribers. And the more subscribers we have, the cooler the shit we can do for y'all. Don't let us be underground forever. We trying to get above ground, Pop. breathe some air. What do you, you say? Trying to pop. Hey, we, we trying to pop. Oh, my industry plan moment. Hey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.